Local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Your Legislators. I'm Anthony Murnell. Joining us this week is New Mexico District 36 Democratic State Representative Nathan Small, who serves as Vice Chair of the House Appropriations and Finance Committee. Thank you so much for joining us, Representative Small. Anthony, it's really a treat to, to get to be here up here, but, but really feel like I'm back home there in the studio uh, with you. So just thank you for this opportunity. It's great to talk with you. Obviously, this is a budget focused session, a 30 day session. I'd like to hear from you since you're heavily involved in this process, uh, serving on this committee. How are things looking right now? There's been a lot of talk and reporting about New Mexico having an excess amount of uh, money and revenue this year. So what opportunities do you see that are really uh, uh, have a great chance of happening for folks in your district and the state of New Mexico? Thank you so much, Anthony. Uh, this is a transformational time. This is a transformational moment, and we have to take advantage of it. What that means is that we're finally going to provide the pay for educators across the board that they need, that our kids and our families need. So we're looking at raising uh, the starting pay for teachers to $50,000, level two at 60, level three at 70 and providing the all of the supports. So uh, teacher uh, loan repayment options, scholarship options, funding the lottery scholarship, as well as the opportunity scholarship, so that any New Mexican who wants to become or switch and, and switch careers and become a teacher or go through school and become a teacher can do so. We know that New Mexicans make incredible teachers. And so we're making, I think, a transformational commitment to our kids, to our families, to our educators, and education after this session will be a place that we um, look to for the opportunity uh, and support that New Mexicans need. Now, We're on, the teacher shortage has been the teacher shortage has been uh, widely reported across the state. Uh, the state has even called in the National Guard in some instances to help, um, you know, fill the roles uh, with the lack of substitutes and the teacher shortage. But, you know, when it comes to education and you're talking about educators, there's really a lot of folks who, who are needed to fill many roles. So what do you think are some of the things that can really be addressed during this session to help fill those those additional roles, you know, the people that are working in the school library, people that are serving as custodians in the school districts. What are some of the things that you think are really going to help folks who need, who don't really have a choice but to show up uh, during the pandemic and uh, serve in those roles? You're totally right. These are folks who are and have been on the front lines. And so we're going to make sure that nobody who is in our education system receives less than $15 an hour in the budget that we just had the pleasure to pass with bipartisan support out of the operations and finance committee we're having uh in addition to that 15 dollars minimum within the uh, for educators there's a seven percent average increase in pay so that we can both retain and recruit folks and there's an additional 10 percent that's going into some of the positions whether those are um you know the supports within the classroom uh, on, on the different areas of support, whether that's uh, speech language pathology or other things, school nurses, those sorts of folks who are critical in our schools uh, and never more so, as you point out, than during and continuing now as we fight to get out of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we have additional targeted raises for them. And I think what it all reflects is that this legislature is making a strong commitment backed up by incredible uh, and, and, and important increases in funding for that entire ecosystem uh, for our, our public schools that we can be incredibly proud of that has helped guide you know, by families, by students, by kids, by educators saying, this is what we need. We want to fight for New Mexicans every single day, but here are the sorts of supports that we need. And in this, in House Bill 2 that we just passed out of House Appropriations, we have those multiple levels of increases, the supports on the back end as folks are wanting to come into the profession, the sort of 
uh, training. Uh, the time when when districts choose, it's completely optional, but when they choose to have extended learning or K-5 plus, that there's that additional time that teachers and educators have asked for to really make sure their preparation uh, is, is there. And when you put this all together, I think we're finally getting into a place where we have the budget and we have so much feedback from New Mexicans all across the state about the needs and to be in a position to help kind of bring those two together this session is something that is just so important and i'm really excited that we're, we're working on doing that another issue tied to education funding um, it was the issue of having access to broadband internet uh, right. there there are many uh, students that don't have broadband at home or they live in rural areas uh, you represent uh, a, an area that that is rural and these are some of the challenges that folks face so i'd like to hear from you what do you think is going to be addressed during this session uh to to expand and build that infrastructure and make sure it's up and running uh, in case there are times where schools need to go back to remote learning sure great question and and even as we transition out of remote learning right when kids are going home doing their homework uh, over the weekends, you've got to have access to broadband. Education is a core part. Economic development is another one. So we're building on progress that we made actually in the special session uh, at the end of November into December. That's where we put over $100 million building on another very large investment in early uh, 2021 that it is bringing well over a quarter billion dollars to this challenge. Now, just throwing money isn't the only thing, right? So last session, uh, we formed the Office of Broadband uh, within the state so that there is one point of contact to help direct projects to interface with the federal partners because we know there are billions at the federal level that are going into this. We've finally gotten that person in place and we've been able to start getting projects to go from kind of the conceptual phase to um, actual plans. And I think we'll start seeing deployment, including in Northern Doniana County, thanks to the strong work of our federal delegation led by Senator Heinrich, Senator Lujan. Uh, we're gonna start to see um, ground being broken, conduit going in. We now have already, thanks to good local work, anytime roads are being done in the city of Las Cruces and we're working on it with the county, getting that conduit in place so that it's much easier to go back in with fiber to support broadband. So what folks are going to see on the ground is uh, actual improvements. Now it's Doniana County, there are definitely parts that are incredibly rural that I'm very proud to represent. There are some parts of this state that are uh, as rural as anywhere in the United States. And so it, it won't be overnight everywhere but we're going to see pro we're going to be seeing progress, including in Doniana County, that wouldn't have been been possible without the investments and now this kind of support and the way to cohesively bring partners together. Now, this is happening during a pandemic. I'd like to hear from you. Um, what are your major concerns with COVID-19 in the district that you serve right now? And uh, Donina County and Northern Donina County. Um, and I'd like to hear from you. What are your concerns right now uh, about getting addressed during this legislative session that could help folks during this pandemic? You know, thank, it's the fact that folks are still facing huge challenges, people getting sick, being hospitalized, people not being able to go into work, whether that's, uh, you know, in the schools or, or, or within healthcare facilities. Those are all huge challenges and we can't uh, fix everything, but I'm excited that folks are really working together in a few key areas. We've talked about in the education realm with full support uh, that, that's going on there. In healthcare, we're gonna be setting aside additional dollars, uh, well over $15 million that's gonna go for hospitals and long-term care facilities to raise provider rates along with huge investments in our Medicaid program. This is gonna help us have more healthcare professionals out there to support more healthcare professionals coming to Dona Ana County and really um, facing and dealing with the shortage we have now. There, uh, within the nursing area specifically, we've seen incredible shortages 
back home across our state, across our country. That's why we're setting aside new money to go to NMSU and other higher education institutions to fund more nursing slots. So we're gonna see immediate increases in pay, incredibly well earned, much needed increases in pay across the healthcare and the education realm for folks who have been on the front lines. And we're working to address um, at that higher education level, making sure that folks who wanna uh, attend either DACC or NMSU, especially in some of these healthcare and other really needed fields, teacher prep, um, that they're gonna be able to do that debt free. That's what we need as a state to move forward from this incredibly challenging time. I continue to be worried just by the basic health challenges, by folks who are sick, by folks who are facing uh, challenges in family income. Um, and so we're trying to work on all those areas. I think we're also, of course, you know, it's winter now, even though it's quite warm for this time of year, about to get cooler, get a little bit of moisture. We're also looking ahead to next year, what we expect to be one of the worst drought uh, times for the state of New Mexico. So we've set aside our largest ever package of short-term drought response, while also uh, supporting NMSU and a lot of their water technology work. Uh, and with the Office of the State Engineer, um, using general fund dollars to support their personnel so that for the sort of infrastructure upgrades that um, the irrigation districts and others want to do that we're going to free up money for that so you know it's really there's no way to underestimate the challenges that we're facing but as we're seeing with the budget and some of the work that's going on informed by expertise from southern new mexico i can't stress enough how great it is to hear from folks you know we had teachers that came up to visit um, that's what's really driving some of these conversations and getting us into a place where we can make the sorts of not only dollar investments, but to do it in a specific way that support folks back home. Now, when you're talking about uh, New Mexico and its future, you've got to talk about economic development. I'd like to hear from you a little bit more about that. Uh, one of the things that uh, you sponsored was a bill to help develop the, hi the hydrogen industry in New Mexico, Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham has voiced strong support for creating a hydrogen hub in the state. Uh, this this ha already ran into some issues during its first committee hearing. I'd like to hear from you as somebody who is sponsoring this bill. Why do you think uh, this is necessary for our state and how do you see it being possible? Sure. Uh, hydrogen is all about decarbonizing our economy and growing our economy. We face a situation where our energy usage is only going to continue to increase, but we have to rapidly decrease the carbon intensity of that associated with that energy usage. So, you know, that's everything from, um, you know, more intensive energy uses in our homes, electrifying transportation, uh, new manufacturing that's coming in, you know, supporting in our border region. The list is endless. We have to produce more energy at a lower carbon intensity, and at the same time, actually draw down emissions that have already been emitted into the atmosphere. Because climate change is really an existential threat to all of us, no more so than in Southern New Mexico. The reason I'm involved with hydrogen, the reason I've sponsored the Clean Fuels Act, as well as the Clean Future Act, we did the Energy Transition Act, it all fits into that same area where we have to produce more energy at lower carbon and build our economy at the same time. And hydrogen really fits into all of those areas at once. There are tremendous federal supports, connections to our higher education institutions and real world applications on the ground. And so we're working to find the right sort of uh, safeguards really uh, to support what is gonna be an industry that's already uh, happening across the country and across the world we want to carve out our place that's the cleanest and also the most supportive of innovation. Well, environmentalists, though, have, have voiced strong concern against this, saying, uh, questioning what's going to happen with that carbon that you do capture uh, right. when it's you know, stored in the ground or it only takes specific rocks that you could really um, store it in. I mean, there's a lot of questions surrounding it. 
So I guess what, what makes New Mexico a, a safe bet with this process? Um, because there still seems to be some, some questions surrounding how do you store this carbon into the ground in a safe manner and a responsible manner? Yeah, it, absolutely true. And it's, the, it's an all of the above legislative strategy. This year, again, in the budget that we just passed, there's a 16% increase there for the New Mexico Environment Department, a 12% increase for our Energy, Minerals, and Natural Resources Department. Both of those are integral to that, uh, that safety, that health and safety framework that you just described to ensure that we have the expertise on the ground, uh, which I strongly believe with the budget that we're moving forward, we're giving ourselves that chance. We're giving ourselves the support to bring in the, the technical um, capacity and to work with the federal government on some of the areas like permitting for the class six wells, the deep injection wells that are critical to carbon capture. The world has to do all of the above and to do it quickly. The more that we're on the front end of that, driving innovation, bringing jobs to Doniana County, making strategic investments, the more we're gonna get more benefits, that is a cleaner environment, a, set, a better economy, the more behind the curve that we are, we're going to feel all of the consequences of climate change with really none of the, the benefits in the offset. So we um, specifically in the within the hydrogen effort, we're working very hard to have the right sets of safeguards around carbon intensity to ensure that the energy produced is at the lowest carbon intensity possible in line with what the federal standards are based on the bipartisan infrastructure law. And then to bring that support in for our, um, uh, our environmental, our natural resource agencies, and to support our higher education institutions to get some of those key questions that you outline right, like around carbon capture. I wanna really emphasize that for New Mexico, for our country, for the world, it's all of the above, decreasing emissions, but it's like a bathtub, right? You turning off the tap when the water's just about to go over the top of the bathtub, uh, that's not sufficient. You have to take out that plug to draw down some of those emissions. This is one of the four key strategies for the world to deal with catastrophic climate change. And we're putting ourselves in a position to be a leader there, um, both with the hydrogen effort and also with the support and the vastly increased support for our natural resource agencies that we have in the budget now. I guess the another question is, how do you create these safeguards within the environment department? Because we're in the year where New Mexicans are going to vote on who's going to be governor for the next four years. You could have down the line a different administration, the possibility of that happening, and different funding going to the environment department. So how do you create sustainable monitors uh, within this industry when you could have uh, the change in executive happen and different budgets? You, you work at all levels. And so within the legislation, we're working to put legal limits and safeguards in a very nuanced way. And that work is ongoing. It's the work we've done in a number of areas and past pieces of legislation for that are that are really helping New Mexico. So you put it in the law you do the work within the agencies that helps all New Mexicans. At the end of the day, the budget increases that we're proposing here, um, I think will be sustainable as long as we keep revenue coming into the state. Uh, these are gonna protect the health and safety of New Mexicans. And that's something I think most New Mexicans absolutely want, something that we can show in this really challenging moment with climate change more renewable energy, more clean energy, more less carbon intensity for the energy, electrifying everything, as Senator Heinrich says. Those are the sorts of things that as communities, as states, as economies do more of that, it's actually going to create more jobs, uh, which while safeguarding the environment. So it's something that's going to be a very positive feedback. And I think that is something uh, you know, when, when I'm back home, I can't tell who, what party registration someone has when they, if they have a solar array on their home, for instance, these are sorts, these are the sorts of policies 
creating, you know, supporting more clean energy. We have $15 million in this budget for the first time ever to support specifically low income New Mexicans getting more energy efficiency. So they pay less of their budget towards that home heating, cooling energy costs. That means they're going to have more energy to, sp or excuse me, more money to spend at small businesses. That means maybe yeah. they're able to be in a position to start a small business. All these sorts of things really go together. And um, the, well, you know, yeah, I, I think I, I, I think our audience gets where you're going with this, um, you know, because we are looking at a, a situation with our climate. Um, we've been reporting on that in depth for a while now. And I want to talk with you about something else that you've worked on in the past and get an update. And that is uh, dealing with the Mining Act uh, Forfeiture Fund. Uh, can we get an update on this? Can you tell us about this legislation um, and how you think it can play a role in that um, and ensuring that if a company leaves or goes under that these mines uh, are going to uh, still be monitored and, and, and put and kept kept uh, in a safe and responsible way because there, there has been instances uh, in the past um, uh, across the country where we've seen you know people a mine mining company may go under and they they just can leave and nothing happens to that uh, you know mine and the pollution that goes with it. So can you kind of give us an update ab about this legislation? Absolutely. We have the Mining Forfeiture Act in statute, something I was very proud to sponsor and pass with strong support. Um, that, just like you said, that means that not only will we monitor, but we actually will be able to clean up in that worst case scenario if a, if a uh, mining company or conglomerate were to go out of business, be unable to fulfill its financial obligations to the state, we'll be able to have uh, those funds that have been set aside. Um, and use those as a state and gain interest on those on those funds in order to accomplish that cleanup. This is something that's particularly important because as we do the energy transition, some of the metals, including copper that, that is mined here in New Mexico, actually are, are exponentially more needed in this economy, right? You need uh, orders of magnitude more in all of the different ways that we're electrifying our, our economy, whether that's electric vehicles, whether that's in the transmission infrastructure that's needed uh, all across these different areas. So the Mining Forfeiture Act is exactly the kind of work previously when it comes to hydrogen and many of these other areas. You have to think about what the opportunities are and seize those, but also think about what the worst case scenarios are and to legally guard against those. And now that we have the Mining Forfeiture Act in place, um, we're seeing folks continue to do business in the state in a safe and responsible manner, but with that strong state backstop uh, that is so needed. Uh, you know, I, we just have about three minutes left, um, but I wanna talk with you a little bit more about economic development and uh, infrastructure in your district. Um, it yeah. seems like they kind of all go hand in hand. Um, being able to have that infrastructure in place uh, so you can um, you know, develop uh, small businesses or other businesses want to expand in your area to have those roads that are paved and to have the broadband in place. Uh, what, do you, what do you think folks, folks can look at today to uh, let them know that District 36 is, is getting um, taken care of when it comes to economic development? It's such a key question. So we are again making the largest investments into the the uh, that that uh, uh, not energy but the information infrastructure things like broadband that we've ever made and we're going to see conduit going into the ground service increase and improve across Doniana County including in northern Doniana County um, out on the East Mesa things like that so that folks do have a better education and and uh, in economic opportunities. We're gonna see more roads that are gonna be paved with the monies that are going out, including to the local match programs that support both the city and the county. We're also considering a really important constitutional amendment that would address some deficiencies um, that have prevented us from going in and working with communities, especially on the East Mesa and in Southern Doniana County to pave their roads when these roads are privately owned. You know, there's a number of different property owners. Uh, it's not publicly owned, but it's a 
road that creates all sorts of hazards that uh, just stays in its dirt and, and continues to, you know, essentially be worn down by flood after flood. We're working on a constitutional amendment there that will uh, modify the anti-donation clause to allow us to put public dollars, take that into the public sphere so that um, we can fix up those roads. We're bringing specific monies back to Doniana County for dam maintenance for that, uh, also for the stormwater prevention. Um, so folks are gonna see more roads getting paved they're going to see better broadband access and more conduit, more infrastructure going into the ground. We can't stress enough to how important our higher education institutions are, where we have a 5% increase. It's going to help NMSU, whether it's in nursing, in high tech, in energy, in the teaching profession. And, it, you know, we've talked about it ad nauseum and it is so true early childhood investments and in education investments those are the most important long-term economic investments that we yeah. can make and on I, top yeah I, i'm sorry we're unfortunately we're out of time and you mentioned early childhood and uh education and care of course new mexicans are going to have a chance to really weigh in on that this midterm election with the funding question that's going to be on the ballot for voters uh, the yeah. Constitution uh, null amendment question that's going to be on the ballot for voters. Uh, State Representative Nathan Small, thank you so much for joining us for your legislators. Anthony, it's an absolute treat. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks to everyone for tuning in. And we want to thank you for joining us for your legislators. I'm Anthony Murnell. We'll see you next time.